So we're absolutely delighted to have Charles Heenan here with us today. Charles L. Heenan is the co-founder and investment director of Kenox Asset Management. He also heads both the investment team and overall management of the Kenox Strategic Value Fund. He has 20 years experience in global stock markets and over time he has developed his own distinct value approach to global investing. He began his career in the investment industry with Brockhouse and Cooper in Montreal, Canada in 1992. And in 1996, he moved to the UK and joined the emerging markets in Asia Pacific, excluding Japan team at First State Investments. He worked as a key member of the successful team for seven years before leaving to start a focused independent global value investment management company, Kenox. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Heenan. Lovely to be here. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, maybe I'll just give a couple of thoughts on how we see the industry and, uh, and how we think about investing. Um, so I'll kick off. I mean, maybe first I'll say something about Kenox as a company. Um, we're a boutique and it is interesting. You know, there's many, many large conglomerates uh, in the industry. Um, so it is interesting to choose the different types of companies you can work for and what you can do. Um, certainly, we love the boutique uh, structure. We think investment management is distinctly um, creative and, uh, and, um, and, yeah, and can be challenging. Um, and so to, to, to do it in a boutique structure, I think is quite interesting. So independence makes a big difference. We're owned by the people who work here. That's a key factor. Um, alignment, um, try and have as much alignment as you can with your, your, your company. So keep it simple, try not to have different divisions. It can earn money in different areas. Um, also, um, I'm a firm believer, I'm the founder of the company, the founder of the uh, strategy. So I have 100% of my equity wealth in the fund. So everything that I have in the stock markets is in the fund. So you know, eating what we're cooking is uh, very clearly part of our uh, culture. And last, focused, just do one or two things. We find that much more interesting and much more committed and much more dedicated than trying to do a whole bunch of different things for different people. So, you know, the boutique structure, we think that that to protect the culture of a fund management um, uh, philosophy, investment, we think that boutique culture can be really, uh, really important. Maybe a little bit on, on how we do that investment. Um, so first off, you know, we, we're out and out, uh, there's all different ways of investing. And I think it's very important for anyone in the industry to try and figure out what's your natural style? What really draws you? Are you, are you really good at identifying the next Google or the next Amazon? Are you really good at, at you know, um, bargain hunting, at uh, finding things in the bottom? Are you great at momentum markets? Are you good at bull markets? Are you good at bear markets? Are you good you know, at debt or in cryptocurrencies or whatever it is? Find something that you really, uh, you believe in and can, uh, and can align to that. Um, for, for Kenox, we set it up around, one, you know, point one is this bargain hunting um, style. You're looking for the highest quality companies you can find, but you don't want to pay a huge amount for them. And, uh, and just over, um, you know, as, as, as we just pointed out, I have um, 30 years now in the industry. Um, and what I realized over time was that's where I found the best opportunities, best risk to reward opportunities. We're not going in what had performed and performed and performed. And I was going to, you know, see how well, how many more times it's going to perform. And the growth is just going to go on and on and on, which obviously, as we've seen over history, has done extraordinarily well. But equally, I found that on my, the best opportunities I had were looking for areas of the market that were facing headwinds. And so the prices reflected that. Now, the key, <laughs> key is are the headwinds temporary or permanent? If the headwinds are permanent, <laughs> run a mile. And almost how cheap it is doesn't matter. It'll get cheaper if the headwinds are permanent. But where you can find uh, a, a temporary headwind, um, that's very interesting if it's priced, you know, the, the price of the company. If we buy the highest quality companies and those they have the best chance of coming out the other side, those headwinds turn to tailwinds. Um, and that's a, it's an interesting, you know, dynamic over the uh, over the longer term of the economy is that you know the economy goes through cycles and uh, and when you get a, an area of the market that's been very very out of fashion for long periods of time all the competition is gone no one's been sending any capex their plants get older and there's less less ability to, less supply now, if demand recovers a little bit then there is no new supply and often that you get a supply lag that can lead to really, really interesting profitability. So that is where 
I figured out that we, you know, I had an advantage over the market. I've done extraordinarily well out of this over time, but also that we can build a business on the back of this. So Kinox Asset Management was built around that one, uh, that one concept of, of um, you know, let's call it bargain hunting. We, we would say it's, it's risk-focused quality value because um, we're always going to look for the highest quality companies. Um, but it is. Um, but what's important about that finding things in the market, especially now, and we'll come back to how we see the market in a little bit. Um, especially now, it feels like a lot of the market has been looking for growth. It's been valuing growth, and you look at a lot of the ways of dissecting the market. Growth has outperformed value, or or momentum, or things that have done well. Profitability that has gone well. What's expensive has gotten better. What has has the most growth has almost seen the, you know more even more growth from there. So what's interesting is that this is very different to a lot of the market. And that to us is quite attractive because it means you're differentiated returns from the market. So that's the point one. I, I mentioned it just briefly there. We talk about uh, quality and, uh, and risk focused. That is one of the keys. I've got 100% of my equity wealth in this fund and I'm really conservative. <laughs> what I wanna do is number one, protect my capital and number two, grow it in that order. And, uh, and so, you know, it is important to know there's a lot of people out there, possibly in cryptocurrencies and a few other areas of the market, meme stocks and so on and so forth. The focus is on getting rich as fast as you can. And that is great, but make no mistakes, there's risks in that. For other areas, you know, for, for the mentality of actually in, in good times, you can get rich, bad times, you can lose it quite quickly. If you want to, over the long term, protect that wealth, you know, capital preservation first, that focus on risk really comes through. Um, you know, it, as we say, we look for areas of the market that are facing headwinds. But interestingly, the when we go in there, you can often find things that are outrageously cheap in that area. If they don't go bust, they're going to make you tons of money. <laughs> but if they do go bust, you lose all your money. So, you know, we uh, we would always lean towards the highest quality companies in the areas we're looking at because it's the lowest risk. It's just the mentality we have. You, you know, risk is a choice. Often you can decide whether you want to take more risk or less risk a lot of the time. Uh, leverage is another fascinating example. I mean, the world has been leveraging up and leveraging up and more and more debt in the markets for ages. Um, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the companies now have quite a lot of debt on their balance sheet. If that becomes a problem, we think it might. <laughs> if it becomes a problem, you, you want to own the ones that have less debt as opposed to more debt. So it's another way of, of a choice you can make where you can have a lower risk profile or a higher risk profile. Um, and one other thing maybe to say about, um, about, um, about you know, running money is that it's, you know, what we do is logical and it's sensible and it can be very powerful, it's made great money, but almost with a lot of these things, they, they can go out of favor for a long period of time. And value, has been, let me tell you, it's been very out of favor. As someone who uh, remembers the 99 TMT bubble, I'm, you know, and then coming out of that and then thinking, well, I don't think I'll ever see that again. And then we had 08, 09 and coming through that and uh, uh, GFC, the great global financial crisis. And, and here we are again. And, and the truthfully, having lived through the, you know, this is my third one um, in the markets, uh, um, you know, this feels as extreme as it did back then. So the, you know, it's been it's been not an easy time. It's a great time for for a lot of speculation, a lot of leverage, um, and a lot of uh, growth. But it's not been easy for um, for for other areas of the market. And I think that's important for everyone to understand in the markets is that it's not always easy. <laughs> if it's always easy, you're probably not doing it right. Because if it's always easy, it just it gets everyone else comes piling in and they, they crowd the trade out and, and so on and so forth. So when you're going through a more difficult time in the market, when the markets are against you, it's that ability to know what you really believe in and the ability to, to stick with it. And that, you know, you get onto the softer aspects of the uh, of investing, the behavioral finance aspects of, the, of investing, but, you know, knowing how to hold your nerve when you need to, knowing also when to throw in your cards and say, no, this is wrong and we need to do something else. We've lost money here, but we need to stop. <laughs> Don't throw good money after bad, those sorts of things. So those, that aspect is, uh, is very important. Again, that's where the boutique, small team, have done it together for a long period of time, really, really helps very clear vision, that's really important. Um, lastly, um, on, the, uh, on the introduction, 
I'd say being um, stewards of our client capital is uh, is very important. You know, there's a lot of talk about ESG now, uh, environmental, social, and governance issues, and um, and stewardship and uh, values values based investment, not just value investing. Um, and you know, we have everyone's going to decide where their values are and what they how they they treat those. But you know, for us, that stewardship of capital is very important. Um, but for us. That doesn't mean see what the ESG score is and, and therefore buy it. Uh, you know, we have to be willing to make our own our own decisions. We have to be able to do that in in what we think is the best long term interests of society and also of um, of our clients. So you know, it is um, it is interesting that we have owned the energy majors, um, and everyone said, well, of course they are evil. And um, but but our our view is slightly more nuanced in saying. Well, actually, this is pragmatic. Um, we actually still use their products every day. And in fact, our society cannot really exist without the lights turning on, the transportation, the hospitals running, the ambulances going. All of this needs the energy and we haven't yet got the substitute. So it must be in the long-term interest of society to not get rid of these people just yet. So we are willing to take that step in it. Um, also as stewards of capital, I do think um, it makes a big difference to see how long your time frame is. Uh, if you're trading stocks like they are little um, poker chips at a uh, at a casino uh, or something like that, are you trading in and out and in and out and every day? That you know, that's fine. It's a it's a it's speculating in in our opinion. If you're a long term steward of someone's capital, then you have to be thinking and engaging with companies on a ten or a fifteen year view and um, and. You know, it is interesting to see our turnover. Um, so how often we buy and sell our shares. Our average holding period is around 10 years. Um, and uh, Jeff and I set up this fund in 2007. About half the names we had in the portfolio 15 years ago are still in the portfolio. So that, that does show that we're really aligning that stewardship. We're thinking in the long term. We're engaging for the long term. And we're staying for the long term. We're not just um, jumping in and jumping out. And in many ways, we you know we think that is that is some of the most responsible stewardship is when you engage with companies and you stick with them when it's not easy. It's all fine when it's easy. It's when it's not easy when they're they're going through a tough time when they're under pressure. That's when you want them to be making the best decisions, not running away from those. So you know over time, we think that stewardship is a uh, is an important um, important aspect. Excellent. Well, now let me just. Let's just talk a little bit about where we are now um, in the world in you know, early 2022. Um, it's been a fascinating, uh, you know, the world is always fascinating and the economy is, uh, is always evolving. Um, but we have had an interesting, uh, interesting time. Of course, we've, we've gone from uh, you know, inflation in the 70s to, uh, to Volcker and high interest rates and and the ending of that in the 80s, the great bull market in both equities and and um, and uh, and bonds since 1982, uh, especially in the U.S. But uh, but globally, it's been still quite a quite a positive time. Also interesting, what's you know the backdrop of the central banks and the central bankers, um, you know, famous Greenspan put: if there's troubles, then the central bankers come in and, and help out. Um, and we've seen uh, we've seen some fascinating markets over the time that. You know, saying uh, a minute ago that you know, having lived through the TMT, uh, actually starting my career in 1990 um, on the buy side in 1996 in Asia Pac. So I started in 1992, but in 1996 I was working in emerging markets uh, and Asia just as the um, as we went into the Asia crisis. So you see a crisis, and then the TMT. So the, the media boom tech bubble of 2000, and then we go into the 2000s and you get into the uh, GFC, the great financial crisis in 08, 09, after again, an extraordinary period of growth and, uh, and the uh, you know, a super cycle for the commodities we were talking about back then, and then coming out of that again. How do we see all of that? Uh, how do we see put that into perspective? It has been an extraordinary time. Uh, and then, of course, the pandemic. Sorry, I should mention that at the end. The pandemic. How do you see that? You, you just have to be aware. This this has been an extraordinary longer term period, but in the shorter term as well, the um, the economy has gone through an incredible situation. 
and one where we have essentially expanded and expanded the amount of debt across the system. Um, you know, it is interesting to, to see that from 2000, yeah, you know, these measured um, certainly by one group that we follow, um, you know, since the great financial crisis, global debt's up 30%. Now, you know, considering the global financial crisis was supposed to be a debt crisis, that was a huge problem. The fact that we have 30% more debt now than we did back then, and it's in different places, but, you know, it's still higher. That's a real concern to us. Quantitative easing, it's been 10 years. Uh, uh, interest rates, quantitative easing is fairly new, but, you know, interest rates, you know, dropped a decade ago and have been at, at all-time low, uh, low levels for years and years and years. I mean, we do, uh, we recommend anyone go look at the Bank of England chart back to 1694, which is the founding of Bank of England. Interest rates had never been below 2% since 1694. And then we dropped them to 0 0.5 to below that for a decade. What happens? No one knows. We've never tried this before. Um, so, you know, very long term, how does that, that levels of debt, that's extraordinary monetary experimentation that we've done, how does um how is that uh, how does that play? And we do think it's risky, um, and so therefore you know we're saying listen when there are underlying risks in the economy, um, a lot of what is done very well in the last five years, and especially we think some of the speculative things, um, you know, meme stocks and companies that have no profits you know, being listed for billions and billions and billions, and um, we think cryptocurrencies. Uh, might be the, the you know the, the best thing we ever invented, but they might also be tied to this uh, money speculation, you know, to be uh, discovered over the longer term. The point of the longer term is that the risk out there is very high. We feel with you know, rarely, if never before, have we had bonds have such a good run as I said since eighty two, so essentially a forty year run. Um, equities, especially in the U.S., property markets across the world. Are, are firing up. Possibly that's due to this debt cycle that we're talking about. So we think risk and especially markets could be extraordinarily, um, risk could be very high. Um, we think markets might be very high. So you have to be really aware for investing on the next five and 10 and 15, and 20 years time for, you know, our career, your careers, our careers, my grandchildren, my children and my grandchildren, you know, what will that look like? We think, you know, we, need to be aware of some of these things and we need to put that into build that into our portfolio so every time we start digging through an individual stock you know we go right to we're very much stock pickers you go right to the bottom and and spend your time analyzing the company analyzing its competitors analyzing its suppliers and customers and so on and so forth one of the things you have to put in there is you know, what risk are they taking on their balance sheet but also how much um, you know, how much uh, headwinds and what changes and what has happened recently, how much change can that have? So we think that this, um, you know, having something that's fundamentally differentiated from the market, I mentioned it earlier, where you've gone through temporary headwinds and moving to uh, tailwinds, um, having that where you're seeing less competition in the future, um, that, that can be extraordinarily, extraordinarily powerful. Um, and just looking across the, you know, the portfolio, a couple of, of themes of what have come out. So, you know, the individual companies that, that we buy, um, Newmont is, uh, is the biggest position we have in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the portfolio right now. It's a gold miner. In fact, we would say by far the leading, you know, the, the strongest, the best um, one, very strong culture of responsibility, of long-term thinking. They've only had 10 CEOs in the last hundred years, it, you know, it's, it's a long-term thinking company that have got very, very safe jurisdictions. There's no debt on the balance sheet. They have long life assets. They invest in the assets to make sure that they are still there for the years, for decades and decades. This is a very, very strong company in an area that has been massively hated for, for ages. There's been, you know, less and less investment. Um, there's very few industries in the world where the, uh, the, the, um, the last cycle ended in 2011. Um, that's when everything, you know, the super cycle really ended. So they're 11 years into a bear market. And let me tell you, there are not many people out there who shipping, maybe it would be another one, the gold mining um, CEOs, four, five, seven, nine years, were just taking it in the neck of 
don't spend money. You know, what did you guys do? You did such a terrible job. And so you have a different mentality. There's no arrogance in that industry. And in fact, everything has been lean and mean and so on and so forth. If there's any upside, so currently, because they've been lean and mean and because we've seen a little tick up in the gold price, um, you know, they're earning very, very good money. They're not spending it. They're paying good dividend. Uh, Newmont uh, has moved up a little bit. So, you know, we were looking at it a month or two ago at a 4% dividend yield, double that in free cash flow. So they're generating free cash flow, which is extraordinary for miners. Um, and, uh, and paying, you know, feeling, being willing to share with the, 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 uh, the um, shareholders over the long term. We think all of that is extraordinarily positive in an industry that's very lean. There's very, very little supply because of that, of that timing. So that starts to, if there's any recovery in, in demand, and we think there's a case to be said that maybe this might be a, not a bad outcome, uh, there might be a little bit tick up in demand, the profitability for those companies is extraordinary. So finding things that can do well, even uh, in difficult times, that's a, a great example. We think uh, telcos, the uh, the traditional telecom providers, um, uh, you know, a very good example would be, um, say, uh, say uh, Swisscom in, um, in in Switzerland. It's a very good provider of. <laughs> of uh, number one player. It's the one who, you know, everyone loves to love their Apple or their Samsung phone, mostly Apple. Um, and, uh, but these guys are the ones who actually make your phone calls happen. And there aren't many of them. There's only a couple of them. You're getting, you know, Swisscom on a 4% dividend yield in, in a very, very strong, you know, strong position is if CapEx comes down across that industry, um, you could see as they have spent to get 4G and 5G, as soon as that spend comes down, the profitability can go very strong and that could be uh, extraordinarily attractive. And this is an essential, like people certainly treat it like one. So, you know, the, one of the last things we'll give up is their, uh, is their mobile phone. So you know, finding opportunities like that, um, we were willing to go other places and Japan, we've got uh, some holdings in Japan, four holdings in Japan, on average, um, they have 25 to 50 percent of the market cap, which they could return in cash. So they're sitting on net cash balance sheets. They could return those in cash, and we would, um, and they, you know, they wouldn't be putting any leverage. It wouldn't be putting any debt. These are heavily, heavily net cash companies, yielding almost three percent, which is a lovely yield, and again, getting free cash flows of seven, eight percent out of these companies. In Japan, which is a com country that everyone feels is, you know, is, is obsolete almost and very um, old school, Hong Kong, even more so. I mean, Hong Kong, you basically take all those numbers and double them. Uh, Hong Kong is very out of favor and certainly the areas that we're looking at. But we're getting yields of 7%, uh, sorry, uh, dividend yields of 6.5 or so percent um, and free cash flow yields currently. And they, there are a few extraordinary. So current our free cash flow yield is north of 15%. So these companies are generating huge amounts of cash and no one's given them any benefit for it because it's so incredibly out of favor. Finding little pockets like that, that are extraordinarily undervalued and, and also have gone through their tough times and are often coming out their other side. These are the type of situations that could be extraordinarily good for um, for you know, make a really robust portfolio. I'll throw one more on, which would be uh, energy. Um, you know, it's probably our largest individual position uh, in terms of sectors, but um, you know, we think the um, that's an area that everyone has loved to hate for a long, long period of time. But be very clear here, um, and, and just in the last day, uh, Russia has gone into the Ukraine. Um, so, you know, the energy is very much on the, on the uh, in the news right now, it's very important to understand. Uh, let's look at the long term fundamentals. That's what matters here, and less about the news. What's happening in the news today? Long term fundamentals is that industry looks very much like a. It is indispensable to our society. It b will need to be for a long time. We still need gas. We still need oil to heat our homes. To 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 you know, for transport to deliver food to our tables. To, you know, to, um, to keep the hospitals going, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's been hugely underinvested. So there's, it's an underinvestment story. It's not about Ukraine. It's the fact that we decided for a while, due to two things. One is 
is the ethical, the climate change, but two, secondly, is just the cycle. They had such a tough time in 14 and 15. These things look, uh, these companies look extraordinarily strong. So, you know, Shell is, um, is our second largest holding currently. The amount of cash they're making at what they made in 2021 um, was extraordinary. And of course, now energy is, the energy market has tightened quite a lot um, in the second half of 2021 and in 2022, where especially gas in Europe, you're seeing the cost of natural gas, so they're not not to gas at the gas station in the US, but to natural gas to, to, to run the, uh, the power stations. It's extraordinarily tight in Europe, but also around the world. We might not have enough gas to keep the lights on for, you know, to, to run uh, inexpensive and um, reliable energy. On the other side, you have a company that's providing that core, um, that core and essential need to, uh, to, to society. And we're getting that at extraordinarily inexpensive prices. I mean, it's still at a discount to what it was a couple of years ago. We're still getting a 25% discount to the share price of what it was a couple of years ago. And the amount of money they're making right now is so much higher. And we're saying, listen, with the amount of underinvestment that's happened in that industry, we're very concerned that there isn't enough supply and that that could cause a real, real squeeze. Shell is a beneficiary from that. And that for us, you know, makes it look like a very, very uh, interesting play, as well as making the right movements towards the investing in the renewables and trying to you know, emphasize gas, which is a, more used to be seen as a transition uh, fuel um, versus oil. We think all of that put it together. We think this, uh, you know, the portfolio looks like it was an extraordinary, extraordinary position in what are extraordinary times. Happy to chat about whatever part appeals. Yeah, absolutely. You did a really great job. A lot of the questions that were asked, you already actually answered <laughs> in the presentation. So excellent uh, mind reading skills. Excellent. Uh, I think that's, yeah, so, so we'll dive into some of the questions. Uh, one of our questions is, how do you analyze the management? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Always a good one. So, how do we how do we see management? Um, listen, when we look at a company, um, and uh, <clears throat> and I you know I highly highly recommend that everyone um, you know, follow the story and understand or, you know the, the pitch that management has made and so on and so forth. But cannot say there's so much information available, especially now electronically online, um, of all their history. And if you can look back over their history and say, well. You know, yes, you're telling a great story now, but what happened in 2007, eight? Uh, you know, what have I don't understand what happened here in 2012, and so on and so forth. That's how you get a really good long-term check on well, you know, was the story as good then, and what has changed since then? Um, so we always look at a 10, 15-year history of what they've done, um, and that involves going through the financials. We you know, we've set up a structure so we can look quickly over a long-term history and then start cherry picking and digging into the individual annual accounts, going through the notes where they matter. I mean, the key in nowadays is not information. There's way too much information out there for anyone to analyze. Uh, it's being able to interpret that information. So look at 15 years worth of history, start diving down into the tough times. You know, nice to see that they've got good times. That comes out pretty quickly. Where do they go? Where the tough times, where do things go wrong? What decisions do they make? How did they do it? You know, what went right and wrong for them over the longer term period? At that point, in one way, sorry, what you're trying to figure out is what's the quality of the franchise? Um, you know, famous uh, Buffett quote at one point was, you know, I prefer to have a company that any idiot, any idiot could run because sooner or later any idiot would. But it's, you know, to understand the the, the, friend, the quality of the franchise. If you have a great, great, great franchise because of concrete competitive advantages, because of where it sits, because of all these pieces, um, I mentioned uh, um, telecoms. Uh, you know, people who provide fixed line fiber and uh, and mobile is. You know, you can have two, three, four, five of them in a country. Five is quite high these days, but you can't have it. But irreplaceable. I mean, you know, it takes you a long, long time to, to put in new bits. So if you have a real concrete competitive advantage there, that's difficult to replicate. That's where you want to start, is you want to start with great companies. Then 
great franchises, then you want to go turn and look at um, at, uh, at your management and say, are they going to mess it up? <laughs> that in our mind is is how we approach it. Listen, there are many people out there who are brilliant at identifying the next uh, Elon Musk or the next uh, Warren Buffett or you know these uh, Jeff Bezos. The, they're real game changing individuals. But it's really hard. Make no mistake, because for every Warren Buffett, there was a John Smith who looked really good and looked good for five and 10 years and blew himself up. Uh, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there who spoke great games and then didn't didn't um, produce the return. So you're always, always keeping an eye on that, you know, judging between the franchise and the quality of the franchise. The guys that are on top of that, how much has that have been to do with the franchise and how much has it been to do with the individuals who are running it? And then, you know, and then what we find most interesting is sitting down with them, taking their presentation, <laughs> throwing it away and saying quarterly presentation, you know, forget that this last quarter, forget the last year. I want you to tell me what happened in this industry in the last 10, 20 years. How has it gone to where we are now? And how do you see the next 10 and 20 years? Well, we're hoping to hold on to these companies for 10 and 20 years. So that actually matters to us much more than the current situation. It's very interesting to see the ones who can give you that long-term perspective, um, you know, lifers who've been in those industries and say, you know, when I started out, it looked like this. And the most important thing we did was X, Y, and Z. You learn, you learn huge amounts. And then at the end of the day, you hope, a that they stick around and b that they uh, don't do too many stupid things and um, be very clear we're, we're biased against um big acquisitions uh, for instance if the quality of the franchise is very high why do you not need to go buy new things um, why do you always have to buy new things if, if if you've got what you've got is very good so you know and and acquisitions work really well when they work really well but that sort of that's much more dependent on individuals and and uh, and that management. So you know, we'd prefer our management to be safe and consistent on top of a good franchise than to be really exciting. Exciting scares us a little bit. We do think the last point on this would be the cult of the CEO and that the CEO makes all the difference. I think that's a real problem in our, uh, in our society. I mean, um, the fact that they're paid what they're paid is, uh, I think, you know, again, <laughs> a bit of an issue. Um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, they were getting paid fraction of what they're getting paid now compared to your average worker and we think that's it's dangerous one we think it's a bit of a waste but almost as dangerous that we expect our ceos to be able to answer all the problems they can't you actually want them to be the head of a team first among equals but first by sort of a, a whisker not by 200 times and uh, and that you know that mentality of the ceos there to solve all the problems of being a superhuman being that's setting way too high expectations. Actually, the quality should come across the whole team, of which they are one person, the most important, but not the most important by a long mile. That mentality, I think, is, is quite different to how a lot of the uh, market has, re has, has treated the CEOs over time. Absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. And can you speak a little bit about your process for generating ideas? For example, how useful do you find either quantitative screening or keyword screening? Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, so you want you want two different areas of, um, of of ideas. We find it most interesting. Quant screening is very useful. It gives you a lot of numbers. It gives you a lot of of, uh, of, of dry, unadjusted uh, information. But history can be quite misleading sometimes. So you have to you have to take that filter and uh, and then you know treat that with a, with a grain of salt. Um, on the other side, um, we think it's it's lovely just to have blue sky ideas. We think this kind of company is interesting, so let's go look at its competitor. Let's go then ask them. You know, whenever you're talking to um, to to people in the industry, it's always saying which which you know which company do you respect the most, and then you go and do research on that one as well. Um, you know, just talking to uh, to to anyone in the street, everyone, what, what company do you really like? Uh, the, the more they study companies, maybe the more they know the managements as well as the products, but what do you find most interesting? So two different streams there. One complete blue sky, just go find something that looks very interesting. Um, the other is screens um, or you know, quantitative screens. So you just say, right, we want it to have you know, low price to earnings, low price to book, high dividend yield, low debt. I mean, those are fairly straightforward. I think maybe the other one we would add on there is 
saying we don't want any peak earnings. Um, so it's similar to a cyclically adjusted PE or sometimes called a Schiller PE um, after uh, Robert Schiller. Those um, mentalities, it's a, it adjusts down earnings. Well, it just takes an average of five or 10 or in, in years of earnings. And it's just a way of looking and saying, what have they earned over the long term, not how well is it going right now? Um, as we said, when things are going really well for companies, that often makes them quite expensive and attracts a lot of uh, competition. We're trying to find things that are at the other end of that. So if you can adjust for that, it's all fairly easy. It's all fairly formulaic. So you can do that. And that throws out ideas. Key with all of this is every time you come up with an idea, whether it's blue sky or quant or, you know, maybe one last one I throw out there is just go read where, you know, where's their blood on the streets? Where is the profitability horrendous or where is things, you know, going terrible? Um, where's the politics horrendous? You know, take a look at those, see if there's any gems amongst that, uh, amongst that weeds, as they say, or you know, they, are, is there, are there any babies being thrown out with the bathwater? That's, you know, another area to look at. That's absolutely the starting point. At that point, you want to start doing your long-term analysis of the company, look at their long-term history, look at the situation now, and look at the, uh, the, um, the long-term outlook for it. And that's where you really are going to differentiate. And, you know, one of the things we would say is, listen, we've got a concentrated list. We have 28 names in the portfolio, 10% um, per share number I've mentioned. So we're only looking for two or three ideas. Highly recommend being selective. Just only buy them if you really, really like it and you want to hold it for a long period of time and don't expect to find hundreds. Look at hundreds, throw out most of them and just go for your fat pitches. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And um, you previously spoke about gold in a previous uh, interview. You also spoke about copper. Uh, what are your views on copper today? I think it looks extraordinarily interesting. It's very difficult. Um, the, we don't own any copper miners. Um, we do own in our gold miners. They do mine some copper. It's it's a byproduct or a co-product of of what they mine. So we have a very small exposure. Where we find it difficult is to find the right company. For that and also make no mistake the, the you know our, our major concern is um it's you know that share that price has gone quite high and uh, a lot of it does come down to it you know some uh, markets especially china uh, and that does get you a little makes you a little bit nervous and um, china has been building very very quickly property has been expanding and we're seeing there's problems in the property sector right now but they've been building a lot of things so they've pulled in huge amounts of, uh, of, of these, um, these base metals. We think copper looks extraordinarily attractive, but make no mistake, there's a risk. You might be, you know, the, the, the future of renewables and so on and so forth means we will desperately need a lot of copper, but there might be a, a little bit to be played out with the China situation. Um, that would be, you know, the China demand could come down for several years because they've been overbuilding in the last 10, that would hurt uh, the copper mine and you know make no mistake everyone is trying to expand their copper as fast as they possibly can so it's not without it ri its risks yeah i think that makes sense and you said something very interesting which was you're struggling to find companies that sort of meet what you're looking for in terms of copper miners what are those qualities that you're looking for that you're not really finding companies that meet those yeah, it's the, um, it's the, you know, one that they're out of favor. And the problem with copper is that everyone knows it's done really well. So the share prices have gone quite high. And so, you know, that's, that is the biggest, uh, biggest one, but also, you know, safe, safe jurisdictions, um, an awful lot of, uh, an awful lot of uh, copper in the world, you know, best mines in the world. Some of them are in Chile and the Chilean government just, you know, made a few slightly scary noises and <laughs> That's, you know, that's the difficulty. I think it goes back to one of those points I made earlier on, be selective. It's, you know, you don't have to own a hundred stocks. You don't have to own a thousand stocks. The ones you own, make sure you're really comfortable with. And we just haven't quite found that blend of, you know, inexpensive enough that we think we're getting a real margin of safety, uncrowded trades, as you would call it, the opposite of a credit trade, um, quality of that, of, of, uh, of the company, in good jurisdictions, et cetera, et cetera. We just haven't found that yet. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, also, so how are you viewing Russia today in terms of, are you viewing it more as a threat or are you viewing it more as maybe a long-term investing opportunity because of, you know, the massively decreasing stock prices? 
Uh, yeah, so Russia, uh, um, yes, is, is cheap and has been for a while. No, we, um, it doesn't pass our quality, uh, it doesn't pass our quality, um, our quality of the line. I, I, you know, that is absolutely what we do. Go look at, I mentioned earlier on, go look at areas of the market that are difficult, where there is, you know, real, real headwinds. And, uh, and Russia is, uh, is, is definitely one of those. Um, on the other hand, though, you ha it has to pass your quality uh, quality hurdle, and uh, Russia is one that we've always felt very, very uncomfortable with because the rule of law is very arbitrary, um, and that means that we really struggle with figuring out um, figuring out what we're owning. So um, we are really concerned that that makes it difficult, and and we haven't gotten over the, the line with that. So. I'm afraid to say, no matter how cheap Russia looks, I don't think we'll own any direct equities there, uh, or we don't, and we have no intention of it, put it that way. That makes a lot of sense. And speaking about investing in Japan, uh, we've seen some pretty interesting sort of corporate governance transformations lately in terms of you have some large companies that now are doing, you know, spinoffs on like shareholder value. That's not really something you've seen in the past. How do you see this moving forward? Do you think things will keep improving in terms of corporate governance? And I mean, there's a lot of companies in Japan that of course have, you know, massive cash amounts on the balance sheets, but they don't really distribute that cash and sort of have no plans to do so. So um, how are you seeing that sort of going forward? Uh, no, it's we talked about the Abe's three uh, three arrows before government, you know, governance reform and so on and so forth. Um, it slowly is how we see it going in Japan. But no, I mean, and and um, you know, one of the things for us, uh, uh, you know, the, the cash on the balance sheet, we, we see huge amounts of uh, these companies are very very cashed up. Um, a lot of them, and certainly the ones we own. Uh, quite important is that they've always got it. They have a history of um, of returning some of that capital. Through dividends, and uh, and it is interesting that you know we're getting a practically a three percent dividend yield in Japan, which is not bad, considering how much traditionally the Japanese corporate culture has been to not pay the dividends and not pay out money and just sit on these hoards of cash. So you know we we feel that we're getting enough. They're 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 doing that, but make no mistake, talking about engagements and how you engage with your companies and their corporate governance. In the last year or two, we've been rattling the cage a little bit more, and just rattling the cage is a bad way of putting. Um, you know, we have been uh, we have been encouraging our companies <laughs> to pay out more because we think they can, and we're not sure that you know the mentality is is a little bit too more. Well, you know, we just we just need it just in case, and and we're saying like that that doesn't apply anymore. You need to be willing to your your operation. You need to have faith in your own operations which are very good operations that you don't need to sit on huge stash of cash, have a little bit rainy day fund. We absolutely agree with just the rainy day fund shouldn't be half the house. Um, so, um, so no, we, you know, <clears throat> are we betting on it? Yes. We think it is. We think the, the mentality of, of Japan you know, is moving in the right direction, but they tend to move slowly. It's a, it is a, a conservative culture, especially conservative corporate culture. Um, so, you know, I think we're at this point saying, yes, we hope that's the way and we think it is, it just will take time. Um, however, we think it's worth waiting around for because the returns from those quality companies and when they return those capital, both of those things can be extraordinarily powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing about Japan is they tend to have... Um, it's the some of the companies that are very interesting. So, for example, you have companies that are these massive, massive conglomerates with lots of business divisions, or you have these other companies where they have this one small niche, but they have this insane market share in that niche, like 90% worldwide. Um, are you more looking for those sort of diversified conglomerates, or are you more looking for companies that have very high market share within sort of their product category? Yeah, it's it's stock specific. Um, so, uh, so we own four, um, one, uh, you know. One is quite an interesting, um, we quite like niche as opposed to the owning 90% share, uh, but we like people like companies that are very, very strong in what they do. Um, Star Micronics is one that we own in Japan, um, is, is a very you know, so strong exporter. They make CNC lathes, um, which in other words, they make machines that then make other machines. Um, so they're often used in medical industry, in the auto industry, in the electronics industry, the machines that make the machines. It's very classic, uh, you know, Japan and, and, and Germany, Mittelstand, you know, they, they provide, the, um, they provide the, the machines that would then be manufactured, the manufacturers would then use to, to build out their, uh, their end product. 
that's an interesting niche so long as you're good at it and these you know these companies have been along, around for long periods of time so that is more along the lines of i wish they had a 90 percent market share <laughs> it's it, you know it's, unfortunately those ones you know tend to be uh, especially robotics companies are great very expensive they're very very peak earnings and so on and so forth so it's a difficult area of the market we think the quality of those companies is extraordinary but it's a difficult area of the market because if the growth ever slows the share prices are going to be really difficult. So you have to be able to analyze growth. That's not our skill. Looking at difficult areas, seeing where the supply is adjusted, and we think any recovery in demand will be good. That's much more our area. So answer is, uh, you know, generally, you know, like to find little niche players, and that's much more where we are as opposed to the really big conglomerates, which are very difficult. Um, you know, you can find opportunities there, but they are difficult. They, they especially take a long time to turn around. Um, there's real niche companies that are very exciting. We tend to find little niche companies that are less exciting, but therefore we're getting an extraordinarily good prices. So our, our companies do tend to be um, on the smaller end, but that's a, you know that's that's a great uh, that's a great one. Another interesting one is uh, Canon Marketing Japan. So Canon, we all know, they have a little their marketing arm essentially. Um, they listed that at one point, so uh, so that's listed on the stock exchange enormously cashed up company not half as exciting as canon but that's not all that bad considering how difficult it has been for some parts of canon um and uh, and what uh, canon marketing japan has done over time is develop into different areas so it actually provides a lot of the canon products it's, that's a, sort of the legacy business but over the last 20 30 years they've developed into other areas so they do a lot of it consulting um, they do a lot of hand holding they do a lot of other you know solutions businesses um, to small, medium, and large businesses, so they sort of cover the whole area. That is uh, is very attractive, but they tend to pay a higher dividend. They're on a lower multiple. They've got a lot of cash on the balance sheet. You know, it's less exciting and, and much smaller than Canon. So a lot of the big people don't look at it, but we think that's a real niche opportunity. And the, what they've done over longer periods of time and build their own franchise. We think that's uh, that's very attractive. So you know those. I, I think that's you know the way I would describe our uh, our exposure in Japan. Niche little companies that you're getting real bargains, but they you know underestimated how strong they actually are. Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. And then, can you speak a little bit about how you analyze uh, pharmaceuticals, especially in terms of Taisho Pharmaceutical and Glaxo Smith Klein? Yeah, well, those are, uh, it's interesting you have both of those, uh, those companies are two in our portfolio. Um, we often say Taisho is a mini GSK, um, mini Glaxo, because no one's ever heard of Taisho, uh, a Japanese company that's not very well known. What's interesting about both, both those companies is that they are both um, diversified. And that's always been quite attractive to us um, in that they are, you're not reliant on one product. You're not reliant on one big drug. You're trying to spread that risk because as non-specialists, we find that really difficult to identify those ones. So the consumer healthcare companies, um, we found very interesting, uh, you know, sorry, consumer healthcare side of Glaxo, you know, we, we quite, a, quite attracted to that and then, then got the huge vaccines business and then they've got the traditional pharma business. You know, having those three legs, that's traditionally been very attractive to us. And we've always felt that the market has not been, uh, uh, you know, giving them enough credit for what is, you know, in the long term, a long, you know, a very successful company. So um, we've been very happy with that. Taisho is a, is a similar, uh, a similar, a similar story is that, you know, they have, um, they have consumer, um, consumer healthcare type products similar to, uh, to Glaxo and these uh, semi-medical products as well as traditional pharmaceutical drugs. Um, and having that balance between the two um, is, a, is a really attractive one. We think, you know, getting those at very attractive prices and what is still, especially when everyone doesn't like them, when everyone thinks that they've got the, the best drugs out there, that's when we're worried because they get expensive, they lose, what you know, expectations drop. When they've had a terrible time for a long period of time, then you're thinking, well, they're probably, they're, they've been trying hard on this research stuff for a long period of time. They just need a few of the breaks to go their way. And that can really drive those share prices. So, you know, we think they're, uh, they're, not, they're not easy to analyze, trust me, but, uh, but that risk to reward um, certainly has, has been very attractive over time. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And um, can you speak a little bit about, you spoke already about, you know, investing in Hong Kong and a little bit about in China as well. How do you think about, let's say, the, the political risks, especially in China, but also some of those can spill over into Hong Kong? 
Yeah, no, it's um, it, it's one that you have to get over the line with. We talked about Russia a minute ago, and I said that's one we weren't able to get over the line with. Um, China, you know, we think it is the second largest economy in the world, and and you know, and and growing. Um, we think that it is uh, extraordinarily innovative. That's a real, you know, it's a real strength to China. You have a real issue with this transition, or sorry, the, the structure where the communist government is there trying to keep in control of the economy, but knowing that it can't 100% control that economy. So listen, we, for certain franchises, for, we think it's, it's we're, we're willing to, to align ourselves to what we think is one of the most dynamic economies and, and you know, essential economies in the world. I mean, again, make no mistake about it, China makes an awful lot of stuff, you know, the, what, that we consume here in the West. Um, it's very difficult to say, well, you know, we'll only buy from them, but we don't actually agree with them politically. If, if they can provide, if they can make great products, if they can make great products all the way from, you know, cheap end and toys and simple stuff all the way up to semiconductors and, and tech and, uh, and, you know, and all the other ends of uh, the very complicated and, and high end things as well. It's a very resilient economy and to be have some exposure to that is uh, very attractive. Hong Kong looks extraordinarily uh, attractive and has in the long term because of the, you know, the old British influence and the accounting standards are always been very good and so on and so forth. We are keeping an eye on that. That is changing. Um, but uh, so, you know, we think that's a, that's still a special situation. Certainly we're being offered extraordinary valuations. I mentioned earlier on a seven, six, seven percent dividend yield, free cash flow yields, double that 15 percent plus cash on the balance sheet, very good companies, some of which don't need to be in Hong Kong. That, you know, that's an opportunity. We still think they'll be doing business in Hong Kong. We think these opportunities are very attractive, but we are keeping a close eye on how quickly that erodes. I still think one of the best exposure, if you believe in China, <clears throat> and, this is, and, and it, is, um, it is difficult, um, you know, China Mobile, uh, they provide, they have a core franchise in a really strong growing uh, economy. Everyone hates it, so we're getting it on a seven percent dividend yield. Um, that, you know, with cash flow generation that's well north of there, um, you know, ten percent plus, probably closer to fifteen, depending on how much you expect their capex to fall. That's, you know, that's an extraordinary number for what is absolutely core of a franchise. The, it, you know, it, it has issues. There's no question about it. You are trusting the Chinese Communist Party to. Uh, to continue to pay those dividends and not do anything silly with it. But to, you know, if your starting point is a six or 7% dividend yield for such a strong franchise, we think that's worth um, it's worth having a hold of. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And are there specific, let's say, industries that you look for, specific industries you avoid? For example, you think, okay, I'm not comfortable with, you know, some of the recent Chinese regulation in regards to tech, so I'll just avoid that that sector. Or how how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, we we you know we happy to go into any sector anywhere. Um, tech has always been difficult for us around the world because the problem with tech, having seen it uh, for several you know over my lifetime and everyone else's lifetime. You know who remembers? Um, you know who remembers MySpace? Uh, you know who remembers Netscape? You know there are names like that. IBM. I mean, in the old days, you used to say, you know, you never got fired for hiring IBM. The the, the great companies at, at a time, and Xerox and Polaroid. I mean, you know, great companies in tech. When their franchise ends, they end very quickly, and that's what's so difficult about analyzing tech companies is. When they go well, they go very well, but the drop off is extraordinary. So no, I mean, in China specifically, we find the tech uh, difficult, but uh, because it is very political, um, and you're much less aligned, we feel, than you are to China Mobile uh, with the Chinese Communist Party. Um, but uh, but generally, we find tech very hard. We also find um, financials very hard, uh, whether that's in Europe, in, in uh, well, globally, we find financials very hard. Banks do extraordinarily well when things are going well. And when they go poorly, it's extraordinarily painful. And that, you know, at the bottom of every financial cycle, chances are the banks are bust if the government doesn't step in, if the central bank doesn't provide it. That's not comfortable investing for us. So, uh, so we find financials and tech are two areas that we find very, very difficult. Interestingly, we also find commodities. You know, be very wary of the commodities you, uh, you move into. 
we think the situation with the energy majors um, and gold is high enough that we can get in there. But generally, we don't find that an easy. It shows you that our level of conviction in those two. Um, so another sort of question that we have is, do you think it's an interesting strategy to invest in companies that, let's say, are in some of these markets like Hong Kong or China, for example, but have, let's say, 70, 80, 90 percent exposure sort of the revenues outside of those countries, but have gotten, you know, sort of hammered anyways, because they're, you know, part of China or part of Hong Kong. Absolutely. You know, that's the type of thing. You know, there's, if you think that you've got an asset that's worth a lot, but it's been sold off for a reason that you think is more to do with sentiment than to do with reality, those are the things that uh, that, that look very interesting. So it's those type You've got to be have conviction. <laughs> You've got to do your homework and make sure you know as 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 hopeful as you can that 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 will not come back to hurt you. But if you really think that's getting mispriced for that reason, I think those are brilliant opportunities. That makes a lot of sense. And for concluding question, uh, what have been the most influential events of your investing career? Bear markets. No, I think it's. Um, I think it is. You know, it it does. Um, it does affect you, but also I think it, it it's it's a reality check. I think bear markets are natural. We get we're human. Uh, the society, the economy is human. It's run by emotion, and things get carried away. And I think the uh, that you know seeing that reminding yourself that stuff can and will go wrong is is quite important. It's quite healthy. Um, you know, every now and again we got to go. Oh shoot! You know, that was a bad idea. We should stop it. Bear markets are very useful for that in economics term. Um, so I, you know, that has um, that has had a huge impact on me. Equally, you know, I, 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 you know, I always say I'm a pessimist, but I'm a pessimist in what is one of the most optimistic things we can do. We are buying hope. <laughs> we are buying human ingenu ingenuity. That's what a stock is. It's human ingenuity in the future to solve problems. That's what brings. Um, brings value to stocks is that they will solve problems and people will pay them to solve those problems. Those companies will do that. That, you know, is uh, keeping that, that optimism in mind um, all the time and seeing it time and time again over experience, buying companies and saying, actually, they do provide a useful service. And if they do provide a useful service, a useful product over time, the market will recognize that. It can take an awfully long time. If you get buying that for pennies on the pound or cents on the dollar, and they will provide that that information. That's enormously, enormously fulfilling. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. This is a really tremendous session, and we really appreciate you taking the time and if you're uh, busy schedule to speak with us today. It's lovely to speak with you. Good luck. Excellent. Thank you so much. Bye bye.